Hello. Alright, I'll let you guys finish the homework after that. <laughs> um, welcome back. Uh, this is the last week. And as I, I try to fit in some of the more um, awesome and useful things uh, that we can do. Uh, and before I uh, get into the material, uh, as a prelude to what we're going to do this week, I want to say that for much of conventional statistical tasks, it makes very little difference what paradigm you use. Uh, the, the, the interpretations are different. Some people find one version or another more intuitive. Um, but, you know, for example, linear regression can be justified, you know, a dozen different ways. Uh, and all those justifications make sense within their own logical framework, and that's all fine. It, it's, there are a bunch of different ways to motivate the same procedures, and they give you the same behavioral outcomes, right? People act on the inferences produced by them in the same way. So it really, all this philosophy stuff is just to keep philosophers employed, right? So that's, that's sort of my knock on philosophy. And, uh, uh, but there are um, some kinds of modeling tasks and things we need to do with scientific estimation where the Bayesian approach has some real advantages, and that is, since we describe everything with probability distributions, when we get to non-traditional, non-classical sorts of problems like measurement error and missing data, um, it suddenly gets a lot easier. Uh, all the stuff you've already learned just carries forward, and data becomes just a special case. Uh, whereas in the classical approach, um, uh, what arrives is something that is called in statistics ad hocery, uh, which is you make up a procedure that seems to work in the cases you study. And there are no principles which lead to it. And, and hockery is deadly. Uh, and so that's uh, that's one of the things that we get to deliver on in the last week here, is we get to show you examples of the non-ad hockery solutions, uh, logical solutions where uh, we just make assumptions, given the information we have about our data, about the processes we think generate the data, and logic figures out the implications. You don't have to be clever and discover ad hockeries uh, that uh, work. Um, anyway. Uh, and I, I do think, however, ad hocery is a great thing for keeping statisticians employed. Uh, uh, and the, the Bayesian approach is actually the simplest because it doesn't support ad hocries, and so people can't propel their careers on discovering estimators and things like that. Right? Uh, so it, it's actually the least glamorous, uh, in addition to being the oldest statistical paradigm. Um, before we get into the material, a um, couple of quick announcements. I've updated rethinking to, to 1.5. I know some of you have already discovered that. I forget what happened in this, but there are some like usability features and a couple of bug fixes, nothing major, but you should always update. Um, I'm already working on 151 on my computer because I've already like discovered some other things I'm changing. So I'm always I'm always one revision ahead of you guys, which is sometimes awkward because you send me problems and I've already fixed it, and I realize, oh wait, I already fixed that. I have to roll back and uh, go ahead and update. Um, and then I updated a I uploaded a new copy of the book and with a fully written chapter 14, not just code. It was in the older versions. There's actually English in it now, and uh, uh, grammatical English. I think it was English before, but it wasn't grammatical. Uh, so now it's grammatical English. I'm, I like this chapter a lot. Um, it's taken me a long time and many revisions to get to it, but but I'm proud of it. I hope you like it. Um, so, this book's almost done. Oh my god, uh, four years on now. Uh, so, let's pick up where we left off before. I I motivated. Um, an issue of getting beyond classical varying effect models with their discrete unordered categories with an example of political partisanship in the United States and birth cohorts. Uh, so just to quickly remind you of that, um, it's a fact that in the US electorate, uh, birth year is a really good predictor of your partisan offset from the mean election outcome in a presidential election and a national election. And the effect <coughs> seems to be that which party was in the white, controlled the White House when around the time you turned 18, uh, and how popular they were, interact to set partisanship for a lifetime. Not in everybody, but in a lot of people. In my generation, the Gen X generation, I go through the Winona Ryder generation, right? I think Winona Ryder is my age, actually. <laughs> and uh, Reality Bites, that's, that's the anthem of our generation. Um, we're very Republican as a generation. Uh, and that's because we came of age when Ronald Reagan was ending his second term, uh, or the first Bush was beginning, and the Republican Party was popular, and we were winning the Cold War and all that stuff. Uh, and so there's this big partisan shift. Uh, the millennials have the opposite shift, because they came of political age when the second Bush was at his same office and was extremely unpopular, and then the Barack Obama election. Uh, and both of those things set partisanship in the other direction probably for a lifetime. And it's a powerful effect. Now, statistically, we care about effects like this because 
age is a proxy for a bunch of common exposures that people of similar ages have. But age is a continuous variable. No two people have exactly the same age, right? Everybody's born at a slightly different second. <laughs> uh, and uh, it isn't that, it isn't what matters is that you don't want to, you, what you could do with age is you could take it and you could discretize it. And you could say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to treat age as a cluster variable and everybody who's 18 gets the same variable intercept. And that could work. But the problem there is there's nothing in the statistical model that notices that 19-year-olds are more similar to 18-year-olds than 20-year-olds are. Because all of the traditional cluster variables and variant effects models are unordered. There's no dimension in which there, any, any one cluster is more similar to another. And that throws away information. Because you know before the data arrive that 18-year-olds and 19-year-olds have more common exposures than either does with, say, 40-year-olds. And you want to get that in there somehow. Why? Because you want to pool more between proximate age classes than between distal ones. Uh, so we need some extension to continuous categories. Uh, and luckily, this exists. And it's been around for a long time, actually. Um, and uh, uh, so to give you a few more examples before we start developing a solution here, um, age is a classic one, but also income. Income is a proxy for a bunch of things which affect human behavior, uh, consumption behavior, and schooling decisions, and all kinds of things. Uh, you can't measure those things, but you can account for the variation and the correlations it induces in individuals of similar income <coughs> if you could treat it correctly as a continuous category, continuous proxy. Um, phylogenetic distance, uh, one I'll return to to motivate later, um, or patristic distance, so that you do phylogenetic work, you know, patristic distance, what's the length of the time separation connecting two species or lineages. Uh, that's also a measure of shared similarity, right? Common ancestry, how much of it is there? And that gives us expectations of the co-variation among species. Um, uh, social network distance. Uh, those of you, the, the suffering social scientists in this course, I uh, do sometimes think about you. And uh, social network distance is another one. You measure the distance a different way, but it's a dimension. Along with individuals who are more similar uh, in, their, in their pairwise distances from one another, or they could be more similar in a bunch of things, right? They share information and exposures, uh, all kinds of reasons that you may not be able to measure, and you want to control for that. Um, uh, and lots of others. You can Once you get into some examples of this, you'll see these issues arise in many, many cases. Um, and there are no obvious cut points in these continua, uh, but we do have a priori reasons to expect that um, Individuals with more similar values of these variables or who are closer to one another in the distances between their values um, are going to behave more similarly on some outcome scale of interest. And we'd like to get in, get all the advantages of pooling in this kind of continuous dimensional space. Right? So how do we do that? And uh, the very common and practical, which means easy to compute, um, easy, easy for your computer, or for us, easy for your computer, approach is called Gaussian process regression, which is a big family of really cool machine learning techniques. Uh, but it, like a lot of machine learning techniques, it has a perfectly logical Bayesian representation as well, and that's the version I'm going to teach you. Um, let's do it in the case of, uh, yet again, a previous data set that I taught you. It saves me the time of having to teach you a new data set. So let's go back to the uh, Oceanic Societies data. Uh, remember, the motivation with these data is there are sizes of toolkits, or you can think of this complexities of toolkits uh, across the different oceanic, historical oceanic societies. And there's an underlying um, uh, evolutionary model here, cultural evolutionary model, which suggests that the magnitude of population size uh, should be related to um, uh, the complexity of toolkits. And um, what was left out, in the, and that's true uh, in a very strong way we saw before, uh, they're associated in a very strong way. We don't know the causal truth of this, right? We never do. But uh, they're definitely associated very strongly. Um, the, what we left out before, though, is, of course, societies which are geographically close to one another share lots of unmeasured common exposures, which may also account for differences in their toolkits. Uh, some of these might be uh, geological ones. Uh, uh, oceanic islands vary a lot in what they are. Some of them are basically glorified coral reefs with people living on them. Right? Uh, sounds romantic, but it's not. <laughs> Nothing grows. <laughs> it's horrible. And then the typhoon comes and you're dead. <laughs> right? It's horrible. <laughs> and, and others, like Hawaii, are massive volcanic constructions. Uh, really impressive pieces of geography with complex geology and good soils, at least on some of the islands, and, and so on. Um, lots of variation. Lots of lots of variation in the raw materials to make tools from. Uh, so a lot of these tool sets, very little metallurgy in Oceania. Uh, a lot of it's 
So tool stone is very important, and some islands have good sources of tool stone, and others, like the coral ones, basically none, and they traded for it. Uh, so uh, the particular shellfish that are available may provide good materials for making fish hooks and other things, and other places they won't. So those unmeasured covariates that might affect technology, uh, the idea that maybe we can capture some of that with location, right? Islands that are more similar to one another may share some of those commonalities. The other thing may be just um, the first chance in this course to deal with direct contamination of one outcome on another. So we've been assuming all along in this course that every case is independent of the others. This is a standard statistical assumption. Um, the way to think about independence in that sense of statistics is it just means conditional on the predictors, they're independent of one another. Obviously, there's correlations across cases induced by similarity in predictors. That's the whole point of modeling, uh, is to be able to make predictions like that. But once you know the predictors, then they're independent of one another, is the idea. And any correlation between uh, different individuals in a data set um, uh, are due to those predictors, and not due to, say, <coughs> one outcome actually directly contaminating the other. But with human affairs, like toolkits, well, tools can move across islands. And islands that are close to one another can actually share technology. <laughs> and we know this is true historically with Oceania, right? There's good archaeology on this. And uh, we know that neighboring uh, societies traded tools. Um, and so uh, there's true contamination now where the outcome variables actually cause other outcome variables to increase right, uh, by proximity. So the spatial proximity can give us a way to deal with that statistical non-independence of the second kind. Right? First kind of non-independence is uh, non-independence before you've conditioned on predictors. The second kind is the really awful kind, uh, right, where your outcome directly affects somebody else's. Right? This is like cheating on the test, right? You know, your answer re uh, resembles Vince's because you copied his computer or something. Like that. So you didn't need to move on if that was going on. But that would be a case where the outcome actually causes the other outcome. Um, and that's the horrible kind of non-independent statistics. These sorts of uh, models that we're going to develop here help us deal with that. You still have to get the model right. Uh, you have to understand how the contamination happens but, um, uh, uh, and model it. But uh, it'll let us deal with that true non-independence. Okay, so we're going to use space as a crude proxy for all these things. And by space here, I mean um, sort of as the crow flies, or actually I think this is sort of like as the, as the Boeing flies, because I got these distances from an airline travel database, so they're great circles on the globe, basically, and they really are like airline travel distances. I looked them up. And there's actually a great online database of this stuff. You can put in uh, locations and get it for all the, all the oceanic islands. And uh, so in the rethinking package, there's this matrix, this distance uh, pairwise distance matrix that I display in the lower right of this slide. And these are distances between two pairs of societies in this data set in thousands of kilometers. Uh, so these are big distances because, hey, it's the Pacific Ocean. It's half the world, right? Uh, so it's a lot of distance here. Um, you've got everything from Hawaii, which is distant from everybody, more than uh, almost more than 5,000 5, or more kilometers from everyone. Uh, but then you have little clusters of islands like this triad of Palikula and Ticopia and Santa Cruz, which are all less than a thousand kilometers from one another and historically very uh, integrated uh, as joint societies, even though they were separate chiefdoms, um, uh, had a lot of contact. So this, uh, these are the distances uh, that we're going to use to model the covariation between the, the tool sets of the different islands. So we're going to motivate it up that way. Does the motivation make sense before we get to technology? Are you with me on motivation? Okay. Um, so these distances in other, in other contexts, if you had individuals, right, you'd want pairwise differences in age. And that would help us model covariation in individual political attitudes given distances, dissimilarities in their age or their incomes or things like that. So you construct these distances based upon your theory about what causes covariation between pairs of units in the data. Make sense? Uh, so in community ecology, the ecologists in the room, you know, uh, community compositions are often modeled this way. It's a common application of this stuff. Um, you get uh, all kinds of effects, like you you spray one agricultural plot, the neighboring plots get effects of that. Their pest distributions change, right? So the spatial effect helps you understand that as well. You get these contamination effects. Um, okay, uh, policing in in the social sciences, criminology, they use models like this to deal with policing in one neighborhood spills over. Actually, you get positive crime in the neighboring neighborhoods. It's, it's the effect that I usually see in the literature. Right? You police all the crime out of one neighborhood, it spills over into other places. Um, big problem in Mexico, as I understand it. Uh, okay, so um, let's start with the familiar part of this model. This will look like a regular old Poisson GLM. We did this before, and uh, the only thing that's really different now 
is this gamma island I. This is going to be our island offset. These are still varying intercepts. You can think of them as varying intercepts. They are, but they're going to come out of gap what's called the Gaussian process that we'll define on the next slide. Um, but they give you an offset from the expectation based upon a common mean, alpha, and the fixed effects of log population for that uh, island. Make sense? So all the mystery comes later on in the model. The top part is E old E Poisson GLM. Nothing new about it at all. Uh, so what is this gamma thing? Um, well, it comes from what I call the Gaussian process prior. Uh, this is another multivariate normal prior. You're enjoying these in your homework, I know, because I'm getting lots of emails uh, about that. And I'm trying to respond quickly. I think I've mopped them all up, right? So there'll be more coming. Um, once you wrap your head around these things, they're, they're great, by the way. So don't be frustrated. Uh, uh, it's, it's just the next hurdle, intellectual hurdle in this. So this is just yet another multivariate Gaussian prior. And what you want to think of is we're defining a prior over every outcome in the data set simultaneously. Every single outcome in the data set, every society in this case, there are only 10 in this data set, so it is a fat mind number, which is why I like this teaching data set, right? But you can do this with 1,000. You can run Gaussian processes on 1,000 observations, no problem. That's why Gaussian's easy. That's why we like Gaussian. And uh, uh, so for all 10 societies, there's a vector. Gamma is a vector of 10 uh, varying intercepts. Um, but now every island is its own unique snowflake, and it has a pairwise distance from every other island. And we want to model the covariation among all 10 of them simultaneously. And we do that. Uh, and here's how we're going to do it. So the first thing we do is we center this normal distribution at 0, which just means the gammas are all offsets from the mean alpha. Right? So this is on log count scale, because right? it's a Poisson model with a log length. Uh, and then there's this thing, bold K, uh, which is a covariance matrix. Right? Multivariate normals are defined by a vector of means, uh, in this case, 10 zeros. Uh, and then a 10 by 10 covariance matrix. And all of the action in Gaussian process regression is in modeling the covariance. So here's the shift that, to catch, and here's, here's the thing you want to wrap your head around. Um, up to this point in the course, uh, most of the action has been modeling the mean. Right? We've, even in all the GLMs we do, we spend all our time making linear models on some transform scale, logit or log, uh, for the mean of outcomes, uh, whatever the distribution was, whether it was Poisson or binomial or whatever. Um, now, the action is not only at the mean. There's still some action at the mean. There's a lot of population in there. Uh, uh, but now, most of the action is going to be in the covariance. And we're going to model how all these things co-vary with one another. And it turns out, because of interesting properties of Gaussian distributions, that these things are often exchangeable. You can put a lot of, take a lot of stuff out of the mean and put it in the covariance and get the same effective predictions. Uh, but what this buying us does is we can go to really high dimensional space and do all of the outcomes jointly in a pretty easy way. Yeah, easy for me to say. Easy for your computer to do. Um, and so that's what we're going to do. And we're going to use the conventional, uh, the most conventional Gaussian process uh, definition of the covariance matrix. Unlike the covariance matrices you're working with for the homework that you're doing this week for, for ordinary varying slopes models, um, the number of parameters doesn't rise with the dimensions because we're modeling the covariance with a very small number of parameters that define how covariation between any pair of societies decays with distance between them. And we just make that definition and we estimate the parameters that define its shape. And uh, there's really, in, there's only three parameters in this conventional function. And on the next slides, I'm, I'm going to explain them to you. Um, but in our example, only two of these are going to be in play. And I'll explain why in a second. So there's really only two parameters that we have to estimate to model all the covariance among all 10 of these things. Um, but you should know is that there's a bunch of different assumptions you could make here. And this is only a very customary and easy to fit one. Uh, but if you have a theory that gives you something better to do, then by all means, as I keep saying, do that. Violate the horoscope and uh, use your domain knowledge to do something better. Um, so for example, in phylogenetics, in a phylogenetic regression has the same Gaussian process in it, but the definition of K here, of the covariance matrix, is different. Uh, it's based upon a Brownian motion model from, a, from the distances, and the expected covariation between a pair of species given their patristic distance. Right? So it's a different function. Uh, I think in that case, it usually has one parameter. <laughs> it's actually uh, Pagel's lambda. It's just about the only thing in those matrices, usually. Um, but it's the same inspiration. What just changes is the model of how the covariance decays with distance. Uh, so let's spend some time. And by the way, I have I got all these nice pictures from Google Image Search of, Poly of Polynesian islands for the most part. I hope this relaxes you as we go through. I found it very relaxing when I made the 
Talk this way. I think this is a Tongan resort. I want to live here. I want to go to there, as Tina Fey would say. <laughs> All right. <laughs> this looks pretty nice. Um, let's go there and do math. Uh, next time we have this course, can we do it there? That would be good. So, um, so we're going to define the way this function works is we define a function for every cell in this matrix, the 10 by 10 matrix, and we say for a combination of societies I and J, what is their covariance? Um, and it's defined by this function. So let me walk you through the steps of it. First, it's just say uh, Kij is the covariance between islands I and J. The first parameter is eta. Um, and you can think of eta squared as the maximum covariance uh, between any pair of islands. Uh, so as the second part here we'll look at, as that part um, uh, goes to 1, you get the maximum covariance in LV eta. So as, as islands get really close to one another, this is the kind of limit of how correlated they can get and still be different islands. The idea. Um, uh, the next part of it, uh, the action part is the thing in the exponentiation. Uh, we raise e to the minus rho squared, rho is our second parameter that we'll be interested in, times capital D squared ij. And dij is the distance between islands i and j. It was the entry in that matrix I showed you a few slides back, right, uh, in thousands of kilometers. And um, it's squared because that induces a particular shape. In fact, a Gaussian shape uh, that I will show you on the, on the, on the, the next slide. Um, and uh, uh, rho squared affects the rate of decline with distance. So if it's a big number, that means the covariation, uh, the expected covariation between any two islands declines rapidly as they move apart from one another. If it's a small number, you can sustain covariation over vast distances. Yeah? We're going to estimate eta and rho from the data. Yeah, David? The maximum covariance of what? Pairs of I, I and J. I, um, well, but for us, a bunch of them. So yeah. you're, solving, you're solving that with the whole equation, and then you're coming back around on a subsequent iteration and putting it into eta? Is that how it works? I haven't understood that question. So Kij is the covariance. Yes. Uh, the covariance is a function of the maximum covariance plus everything. Right. That's right. We, we, we don't know the maximum covariance until you solve the whole. It's a parameter. We're going to get a posterior distribution over it. Okay. Ada and rho will have posterior distributions. This is still full Bayesian inference. So, and, and just to remind everybody, because I have to with my mantra, like, what does that mean? That means what the model does is it counts up all the ways the data could happen given each value of the parameters, and then it ranks all the different values of parameters that way. That's all the posterior distribution is: is the relative rankings of the number of ways the data could be produced consistent with our assumptions. Right. That's all it does. It's magic, uh, but not magic. It's like the dumbest kind of robotic thing, but fabulous at the same time. Um, so that's what we're going to get. We're going to get posterior distributions for both of these, consistent with the data. But in the code, um, for any particular, like a pass through a Markov chain, eta and rho have fixed values on one set of samples from the Markov chain, right? And uh, they're plugged into this formula, and it defines the whole covariance matrix. Then a likelihood is computed from that. For any set of gammas that are proposed by the chain, uh, so and then there are iterations that go through in the algorithm. Absolutely, and depending upon the, the MCMC algorithm we use, that'll be done in different ways. Um, HMC is really good at this stuff, uh, but uh, Gibbs sampling does a great job with these too. Uh, in fact, the best way to fit these is not even to go full Bayesian uh, because if everything's Gaussian. Then this won't be because we got Poisson at the top, but if the outcomes are also Gaussian, I wouldn't even use Stan. I do GP stuff probably. I say in the book. There's this great, yeah, Google it. Uh, there's this great package called GP stuff, uh, which is repeating Gaussian process regressions. It's really good. No, it's 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 really nice. Um, so, all right, uh, let's explain this middle part and this convention. So this functional form is often called the L2 norm uh, for reasons you don't need to know, <laughs> but that's just often what it's called. And um, a norm is just a distance function in analytical geometry. That's all it means. And uh, so it's a way of constructing a distance, saying how far apart things are. And uh, it's a square distance function. So what this induces is a half Gaussian shape, decay of covariance with distance. Because remember, all the Gaussian is, the way you get a bell curve is you exponentiate a negative parabola. So if you've got something and you square it, you put a negative in front of it, then you exponentiate it, you get a bell curve. That's all the Gaussian distribution is. Uh, and there are deep uh, maximum entropy reasons for that that have to do with parabolas and the definition of a variance, uh, people who, who are interested in that. But um, that is, you don't need to know that. So, so on this plot, what I've showed you is uh, 
the solid curve is just an example of what this squared distance function would give you. Um, and here I've set uh, eta to one, um, and uh, I forget what I set rho to in the example, probably just one. Uh, so what I want you to see is compared to a linear case, the linear function would just be you get rid of the squared distance and you just put in the absolute distance. Um, and uh, in the squared case, um, initially, uh, units that are really close to one another, there's a kind of a, it doesn't decay very rapidly at first because it's that kind of plateau in the middle of the Gaussian distribution. Uh, and then the, dis the decay of covariance with distance is fastest at these intermediate distances, not at the closest. Whereas with the linear one, um, covariance decays fastest immediately out of the gates. Uh, so there's no kind of like close field of interaction where they're bound together. Um, why use one over the other? Well, they do have different properties. Uh, in particular, the Gaussian one's easier to fit. <laughs> I think that's actually the reason it's used so much. Um, but in terms of uh, general social science, it makes sense to say that uh, really close things, there, there's a field of really close things that share common exposures, right? There's a region of that. We're trying to estimate that. And the Gaussian function will be way better at it. You can think about those of you who have a physical science background. This is kind of like the inverse square law. It's not the same relation, but it's this thing about if you're, if you're flinging darts out in a high-dimensional space, uh, the decay of things hitting in different cells decays as the inverse square of the distance. Some of you have physics background. Anybody here have any physics background? Paul, where's Paul? Yeah, so I know there's one person. You're like my physicist in the room. So, and the inverse square law is like all the electromagnetic spectrum applies to that. So does gravity. And it's because there are particles flying out and decaying and they spread with distance. And that induces this inverse square relation. Uh, these things don't work exactly that way, of course. And we don't have the basic physics of these things down. But it makes sense to say that with distance, the decay is not linear. Uh, because they're scattering, right? So the Gaussian thing has more scattering, in a sense, than the uh, pure exponential one does. Does that make some sense? Um, so to say that things are strong when they're close, and then uh, it decays very rapidly with distance. Okay. Um, or inverse square doesn't look like either of those, actually. <laughs> right, so maybe it's a bad example. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, back to the function. All right, last little bit on the end. This is called the jigger term. Uh, uh, jigger means like wiggle or play. It's like an old mechanical term, right? There's something loose in your motor and it's shaking. It's jiggering. And, uh, and uh, so this is um, when distance is zero, this whole thing in the exponent evaluates to one, right? Because e to the zero is one, right? Anything to the zero is one. <laughs> That's nothing to do with e. Uh, and that means you get eta squared, um, and then delta ij is, um, uh, let's just call it an indicator function. And uh, when i and j are equal to one another, it evaluates to one. When they're different, it evaluates to zero. So all that does is it turns sigma squared on and off. So sigma squared is the additional variance of two units that have exact, or that are piled on one top of one another. The purpose of this is, um, I mean, actually, it's when it's the same society. If you had multiple observations from the same societies in the data set, this would allow those to vary from one another by some excess amount. So this is the diagonal variance term in the, in the variance covariance matrix. In this data set, this will never happen because each row is a separate island and we only have one sample from each island. When would that not be true? Say we actually had a time series for each island. Like from the archaeological data, we could say, you know, at 800 BC, the toolkit was this complex, and then at 1000 BC, it was this complex. Then you'd have multiple observations from the same islands. Obviously, they're zero distance from one another, but you expect them to vary a certain amount. So this parameter sigma squared is the variance uh, in each unit that's exactly the same. Does that make sense? It's going to end up not mattering in this model because we don't have more than one observation from each unit in the data. So it only matters when i is equal to j. Okay, so let's put it all together. This is what the model looks like. Um, I don't think there are any surprises once you get below the definition of the covariance matrix. There's just a bunch of fixed non-adaptive priors, uh, but the Gaussian process prior in there, this is going to induce pooling. Uh, absolutely it will, and all the other things. If you had, there's not imbalance in sampling in this data, but if you did, it would handle that as well. It's the continuous category extension of the varying effects approach. Uh, we haven't gotten to the, how slopes get in here yet. Uh, I mentioned that in the notes, uh, how you can extend this. Actually, I think I get to it at the end of today, actually. Um, so let's carry forward with this and see how to do it in, in code. Uh, this is a case where 
doing this in map to stand hides some of the mechanics, um, uh, but it, it makes it a lot of a lot more convenient for you. I just have this template called GPL2. That's the Gaussian process L2 norm, where you give it a distance matrix and then the parameters and notice I've fixed sigma squared. Uh, because we don't want to estimate it because it never matters for the likelihood because there are never two observations from the same island. Um, but this, all that GPL2 thing does is it <coughs> defines the covariance matrix. It handles the KIJ line for you, uh, constructs it. Um, and then it's really just a multivariate normal prior, just like the ones you've been using before. Yeah, question? If your distance comes from Euclidean distance or something? Whatever, it could be any kind of distance you want. Uh, it could be metaphorical abstract distance, uh, whatever you think. Whatever your theory tells you is the right kind of distance to use. Um, uh, this is routinely used in all kinds of situations where it's just any old predictor, and you compute the square distance between the value of that predictor for any two units in the data. Uh, people do that all the time, rather thoughtlessly, I think. But uh, if you have a good theory about it, you could probably do better. Yeah. Euclidean, particularly in this data set, these aren't Euclidean distances because they're, they're great circles on the globe, but. Uh, uh, but these can't be the right distances for social interaction because there are trade winds and currents and other things that induce stronger connections among islands. Uh, so um, Hawaii is even more distant uh, from the other societies in this data set than this, this as, the, as the Boeing flies distance indicates because none of the trade winds or currents will get you there uh, from the rest of Polynesia. Right? Hawaii is just out in nowhere. And uh, there's nothing else in the area. And it took them forever to discover it. People get to Hawaii really, really late compared to the rest of Polynesia. So you know this. The anthropologists over here know this, right? This is a famous thing that we all study. Um, how rats got to Hawaii and stuff like that, right? But uh, which is not the best way to track it. It's like you know, rats and pigs and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, uh, so what was I going to say? Uh, yeah, so I encourage you to demystify this a little bit and make sure you understand what's going on. Um, when, after you compile this model, Take a look at the stand code. Remember, there's this function rethinking package just called stand code. <laughs> this is stand code and give it the fit model. And it shows you the code that is actually being used to define the Markov chain. And what you'll see in there is there's a loop that defines the K entries. It really just does. It just goes over, iterates over all of the lower diagonal, the lower triangle of the matrix, and defines them all. And uh, it's just that mindless. It's exactly what it does. It just pulls out that function. And so when you want some other function, you can start with that stand code template and put anything in there you want. Uh, that's really all there is to it. Yeah, question? So, so this Euclidean model that you're, or this piece, this, this process that you're putting in there is taking place at the varying intercepts that we talked about last. Yes. Is there any reason to have both of those in the model? You could, absolutely. So you had other clusters, other kinds of clustering uh, going on, like you know language groups or something like that. Um, you could still cluster on the other things as well. Because then it's like the cross-classified model, right? There's there's an offset due to spatial proximity, but there may also be offsets due to other things uh, that you may want to cluster on that are more traditional discrete unordered categories. Absolutely, you can do them all at the same time. Uh, in a practical sense, you might reach a threshold where it just explodes and grinds to a halt. And, yeah, you drop out of school. But <laughs> uh, but in general, you can do it. People do it. Yes, absolutely. This this lives well with other all the other stuff. It's like an erector set. You can plug all these little modules into your Fancy little board and make it do things. Yeah, it might overheat at some point, but they're a hand. Yes? Um, if the, so basically, the 0 0.01 doesn't do anything. It never affects the likelihood of anything. So well. why do you have to include it? Because it's part of the definition of the function. The function okay. allows you to have a parameter there. Okay. When you fix it to a value, then it goes into the definition, but it never affects the likelihood because there are never two observations of the same okay. thing. So if you don't put it in there, you could get. If you leave it off, you'll get an error because that function expects four arguments. Okay. Uh, yeah, does that answer the question? Uh -huh. Yeah. But basically, it's there because this is a template that is trying to make things easier, and so it's not ideal for all purposes. That's what goes on. This is very common, by the way, that people define this process this way and then fix the jigger part uh, to some constant. It's extremely common. Um, the jigger part doesn't matter much, especially if, you, if you've got another variance parameter somewhere in the model because that'll soak it all up. Um, so you have to be careful about identifiability, too. OK. Uh, fit this thing, this fits great. Um, and uh, uh, I say something in the book about like effective number of parameters are, are small. There aren't even, we've been, we've been, we've only added two parameters to model this 10 by 10 covariance matrix. So it's not parametrically very rich. Um, the coefficients, just to talk about it for a moment, these g's are the offsets. They're the 
continuous category, the Gaussian process equivalent of varying intercepts for each society, each of the ten island societies. And uh, the, it's hard to interpret these, though, because they're on the log scale. Remember, this is the Poisson model, so we're on the log count scale. And I don't know about you, but I have a hard time thinking on log count scales. Um, it's a magnitude of a count, okay? So bigger is more, <laughs> and smaller is less. Uh, but depending on the value of the others, the scaling could be a big deal or not so much, right? Because it's exponentiated once you get back to the count scale. So this is another case, uh, to rehearse my mantra here, of you want to push predictions out and see what the model says uh, on the outcome scale instead. Um, and in particular, uh, it's, bit, it's really difficult to interpret eta and rho directly. Um, and notice I fit them on the squared scale, uh, because why not, right? <laughs> and... Uh, uh, Obviously, I mean, this is some covariance, okay, but on the log scale, right? Because it's the covariance of a logged offset. And again, it's pretty hard to interpret that. Um, and this is a number, and is that bigger or it's small? Well, it depends upon the scale you measure distance on. So this is all, again, interpreting coefficients is, is parameters is hard to do. Tables just don't tell the story, especially in a model like this, where now... Eta and rho only have meaning in combination because together any pair of values for eta and rho define a function that defines a covariance matrix, defines that uh, covariation with distance. So that's what we care about. So let's turn to that um, before we look at predictions on the, on the outcome scale. Let's look at what the model says about the decay of covariance uh, between pairs of societies as they get further apart from one another. And now we have a posterior distribution of covariance functions. So there's a, there are functions in your posterior distribution. There's a distribution of them. And if, for every unique uh, combination of eta and rho, there's a unique covariance function. Uh, well, actually, I shouldn't say it's unique. It may be unique. There probably are a bunch of different values of eta and rho that will give you the same function. I haven't thought about that. That's, that's a good algebra homework problem for a different course. <laughs> so, um, uh, they might be unique. Uh, but anyway, uh, so... Uh, any combination of eta and rho imply a covariance function k, and we can plot that out. So we can take samples from the posterior distribution and plot the covariance functions. Um, and that's what I've done on the right-hand side of this slide. The code to do this is in the book, um, where you draw samples from the posterior. You get, know the definition of k. It's at the top of this slide. You plug in eta squared and rho squared. We can ignore the jigger part, right? And uh, then you just draw it. Uh, and the curve function in R is sufficient to do this. Uh, what I'm showing you here is the thick one is the posterior median. Uh, so just to give you some idea of the center of gravity uh, in the posterior distribution here. Um, and then there's a whole range. Um, there are a lot of posterior functions which have um, less covariation at close distances, and then there are a lot that have more. And there's a, there's a really long tail of really extraordinary uh, covariances over distance, but they're unlikely, right? They're pretty sparse in the distribution. Does this make sense? Uh, so again, it's like, well, what is this saying? Um, well, uh, you can get a little bit out of it. Um, so for example, by the time you get to about uh, 4,000 kilometers, um, the vast majority of the posterior distribution decays to nearly zero covariance, right? And by the time you're at six, there are only a tiny wisp of like 1% of the covariance functions which have any covariance uh, beyond, say, 6,000 kilometers. And why is it Hawaii is running that? Uh, but there are many pairs of islands that are closer to one another, uh, which do have some covariance. But how is that decaying with distance? Um, and notice that at the median, there's a lot of covariation between islands that are within a thousand kilometers of one another. There's a lot of covariation. It's on the log scale. Yeah. Question. So when you when you have other predictors in the model like population, this is the covariance of the remaining variation. Exactly. This is this is controlled for log population. Exactly. And if you as a as a exercise for the student, I recommend taking log population out of the model and running it again, seeing what the covariance function will look like. Um, what we should expect is that it goes up at all distances, right? Because there's uh, big islands are next to one another uh, in the data set, and so once you put log population in there, you take out some of the variance that would be explained by this relationship. So this is kind of what's left over. What can't be accounted for by log. Um, all right. You guys with me? Yeah? All right. Okay. Uh, so next step in crawling forward to understand this model. Um, let's take the median, the posterior median covariance function and see what correlations it, said, it says exist between islands. And let's look at the correlations because then this is scale-free. 
right? Now we're just thinking about whatever, however much variation there is in tool complexity in the data set. Let's get rid of that part from the data and just think about, in a scale-free sense, how correlated the different islands are with one another uh, as an expectation of their distance. And that's what this uh, calculation is. Um, and I, again, the code to do this is in the book. It's very straightforward. Um, and I apologize for the blue line. I, I misaligned my fish a little bit, it looks like, right? But, uh, uh, so, for example, up here, there's this triad of islands, Malekula, Ticopia, and Santa Cruz, which are close to one another. Uh, they're all uh, less than 1,000 kilometers from one another in a little triangle in, in the South Pacific that I'll show you on a map in a moment. And um, they're pretty highly correlated. Uh, even after accounting for population size differences, right? These are small islands, but they do vary um, uh, and in their population size and in their toolkits. Uh, there are um, some islands, uh, like uh, Yasawa here, which is uh, not very correlated with any of those because it's far from them, and not so much with any of the others very much either, right? You get a little bit of correlation with some of the other islands. These are its closest neighbors. Um, uh, Hawaii is really far from everybody, so it's zeros every place, right? Special Hawaii. Uh, and then a big field of things in between. We get some uh, bigger ones. Uh, uh, Fiji um, uh, correlated with Balaikula and Tikopia. Um, and very highly uh, over here with Tonga over here. That's, uh, and uh, Tonga and Fiji are actually close to one another. They're big rival chiefdoms. So we, uh, they definitely interacted um, next to one another. There was a lot of water, but, you know, they had great boats. <laughs> so... Uh, all depends. For me, it's a terrifying amount of water. For them, maybe not so much. Um, does this make sense so far? This helps you a little bit, right? You get a little bit closer to the idea of what it's saying. It's saying that at close distances, there's a lot of correlation expected that, that's consistent with geographic proximity that's unexplained by the other things we have in the data set, right? They're more similar uh, than expected by chance, um, and that similarity uh, uh, goes along with proximity in a strong way. So, make sense? So, that gives you a better way to understand it. Now we do plotting on the outcome scale. I want to show you two ways to do it. And I'm not going to show you the code to do these, but the code is in the book. So you take a look. There's nothing source, there's no sorcery involved here. Um, but let me explain what I've done. I've taken that correlation matrix that I computed on the previous slide, and now I've plotted up the islands uh, by longitude and latitude, uh, which is in the data set, uh, conveniently for you. And I've scaled the sizes of the points by the log population. So you can see why he's bigger. Hawaii is a lot bigger than the other places, by the way. So if you do it by linear, it's like the whole the whole map is Hawaii. It's just like one big Hawaii. Um, it's so much bigger than all the others. But uh, um, and then the lines connecting them are the the darkness is proportional to the squared correlation. Uh, it's just just because it makes it easier to see what's going on, right? Um, and uh, so here's our little triangle in the South Pacific of Malekula, Ticopia, and Santa Cruz. Very highly correlated. All of those are greater than 80% correlated with one another. Uh, so dark lines. Um, uh, Fiji and Tonga, uh, about 75% correlated, if I remember right, something like that in the data set. Um, and Fiji is about 0.5 correlated with Malekula and Ticopia. Uh, that's kind of what it looks like there. So you can see the, uh, how it lays out. Um, the Trobrians and Manus is the other uh, strong correlation in the data set. Um, I have a hunch about what that is. I think it's absence of tool stone. Those are miserable places with no good stone. <laughs> and uh, uh, so it's hard to make tools, and they have small tool sets, uh, as I remember the data set. Um, does this make sense? This kind of helps, gives you an idea of what's being said. The problem with this representation is you can't see tools, and that's the thing that's being predicted. The correlations are about tool complexity, but you can't see it on the map. Um, so let's look at it to complement that. Let's look at this the traditional way we looked at it before against log population, log population on the horizontal, total tools on the vertical. The lines mean the same thing, but now the islands are located at their combinations of log population and total tools. And then the dashed trends are the counterfactual expectations for some new unmeasured societies, right? Just using the mean. Zeroing so out the offset and thinking about the average society, what's the relationship? Between log population and tool complexity, and it's given by um, the mean is given by the central dashed line, and then I think 95% intervals of the mean um, by those. So there's a lot of variation, right, uh, in this. Uh, and then what you see is you get these things where this triangle of Valleycula, Santa Cruz, and Ticopia, they're below the expectation. The, what the correlation has done is drag them all down like gravity into simpler tools, 
And this doesn't tell us what the cause is, but it suggests that there's some common relation among them that gives makes their tool sets less complex than we'd expect by chance, given their population sizes. Their tool sets are simpler than their population size says it should be, given what we learned about population size from all the islands together. Does that make sense? Uh, so that's their offsets. Uh, Fiji is an interesting case because it's got gravity from you know the uh, the, the three dumb brothers here, right, <laughs> uh, who have simple tools. Uh, it's being pulled down by them, and it's being pulled up by Tonga, which has a very high, it has a much more complicated tool set for its population size than you'd expect. So it's pulled by both. It's correlated with both of them. And what the model's saying is it has an offset that basically sets it on the expectation. Uh, but if, it, if, it, if Tonga were gone, what the model is saying is Fiji would be below the mean, right? It'd be pulled down by those others. And if, uh, in particular, if Santa Cruz were gone, uh, then Fiji would be above the mean because it's close to Tonga. It's the idea that's in between. So whether that's a contact effect or whether it's a geographic effect, something about raw materials or something, we don't know. The data doesn't say. Uh, but that's how the model sees this. These varying intercept offsets can deal with, it's the whole matrix at once. And you've got these diffuse influences pouring out in every direction from all of the pairs in the data set. Uh, it's just describing those correlations. It's up to you to figure out what they mean, if anything. Does that make some sense? Yeah, go on. I'm trying to remember from when you first designed your data set, did you look at um, other variables that it could have explained to the model from the other point? And, yeah. And this is the main, the main approach. Um, yes, so Michelle's paper, there's, a, there's an appendix with a ton of ecological covariance uh, that they looked at. and. Mainly, that was kind of a wash, if I remember right. Uh, they didn't do a Gaussian process regression. This is my like hobby uh, <laughs> to add it to the. Well, I already added the data set for the Poisson chapter, and then I, just, I needed the Gaussian process example, and I thought I'd do that. Um, I should probably ask Michelle if she wants to publish this. Uh, that would be, be useful. I guess I'm about to publish the book, and it will be in there. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, anyway, so it, what would be awesome is if, there, if the ecological covariates wash all this out. And you could remove all the spatial contamination, what looks like spatial contamination here by knowing the actual ecology of the islands. That would be cool. Uh, but I don't know. There's only 10 cases, so at some point there's a limit about what we can do. Um, anyway, other questions about this? No? OK, let me, let me give you uh, the mind-expanding summary of this before we transition to the next topic. Um, Gaussian process regression has a bunch of different applications. They often look completely different from one another. But under the hood, it's the same idea. You're modeling the covariance in a high-dimensional distribution. And you're, essentially, the model predicts all of the things at once. In this case, it was all the parameters. You're predicting all those gamma parameters at once. They have a common prior. And what your, the action uh, where your model goes is into the covariance matrix and not into the mean. So this is pretty different than the other stuff we've done. Um, not completely different. Varying effects have an element of this, right, where we start modeling variation and how it's structured hierarchically. Uh, but this really takes it uh, to another level. Um, takes it to 11, as we say in my house. Uh, <laughs> right? People know that. I don't know. <laughs> if you don't know that, shame on you. <laughs> um, so uh, there's a big literature where people study uh, seasonality, uh, particularly in the social sciences, using Gaussian process regression because you can put cyclical functions in the covariance matrix definition, like sines and cosines are the easiest. So think about... Uh, as, as time is a distance, you don't expect individuals, the further away from one another they get in, or measurements, the further two measurements get away from one another in time, you don't expect them to get continuously less similar because there are seasonal effects. Eventually, it's spring again, and then the phenology of the plant returns, right? Uh, this is also true of all kinds of things with people. Like, people like to have sex during football season for some reason, so <laughs> kids are conceived during football season. And in North America, at least, this is a mystery that it's descriptively true. So there's this seasonal effect. Uh, and so cyclical functions in the covariance matrix are extremely useful uh, for predicting birthdays. Uh, right? So there are these recurrent effects of the calendar. Uh, so people don't give birth on weekends for some reason. Uh, or Christmas. Uh, babies don't tend to be born on these days. It's, you thought it was not under your control, but apparently if the doctor won't see you, you will keep the baby inside. <laughs> That's basically, I think what happens. <laughs> and, uh, lots of babies are born on Valentine's Day. It's a famous effect. Uh, so um, even prior to C-sections, uh, it's often true. So um, you can usefully model all kinds of seasonal effects, cyclical periodic effects over distance with using sines and cosines inside your definition of K. And there are tons of examples of that out there very useful to do. Um, 
so um, I already mentioned phylogenetic or patristic distance. Uh, uh, there's a big literature on this. They don't usually mention that those models are Gaussian process models, but they are. Uh, your, your, you start with the phylogenetic tree is used to do is to define a set of patristic distances, which is the full loop length from one species to another in the tree is its patristic distance. You just count up the branch lengths going up and down. Um, then you make a matrix of those distances, and then you define a model of how uh, phenotypic differences between species or genetic differences accumulate over time, given the patristic distance. And both your clocks come into play and models of selection. Whichever of those you adopt, then there's a way, there's a function for taking those patristic distances and defining K for each pair of species. And that's how all those models work uh, in the mainstream work, at least. Uh, there are some other kinds of model types, but nearly all of them are special cases of a Gaussian process as well. We can unify them under this. Um, social networks, uh, again, the network distance is the thing you can compute given different theories about how things move through networks, right? So like the total path lengths that connect things to networks. Um, uh, so social networks, it's, it's just metaphorical distance, right? Uh, but in physical networks, you can actually measure this with flow diagrams, right? How long it takes for chemicals to diffuse through plumbing. Uh, you can do these things this way. And, uh, uh, but for information sharing and social networks, this also works and it's used quite a lot. Um, uh, again, the covariance matrix may not be exactly the same. Sometimes people use uh, the, the L2 norm one, but sometimes they don't. Um, and then there's a very broad use where uh, people just use Gaussian processes to do splines. It's a non-parametric form of non-parametric regression. It's extremely useful, but it's still the same kind of model. What they're doing is inside the traditional linear model of regression, there's nothing but a mean. Uh, and um, sometimes not even that. It's just all the mean is zero. And then what they do is uh, they use terms like the one I've got here at the bottom, the log pi minus log pj squared. For every covariate in the data between any two cases i and j, you just construct that distance, and it all goes into the covariance model. And it turns out you get splines estimated for the data from this, from the distance, because close ones in their values and the regressor on the x-axis are more similar in their values. And it's, it's a very robust and powerful uh, low-parameter way to get um, Bayesian splines. Uh, used a ton in machine learning. Uh, very useful. Um, and you can add a bunch of predictors in. So this leads us to the last thing. Um, often we have more than one covariate. Well, that's okay. Just stick them all in the distance function. Now, obviously, theory matters. But here's the most common approach um, in the L2 norm approach. Inside here, we have a bunch of terms uh, where there are different rows. There's a, a row for D, which is the relevance of geographic distance in this case, is what we called it. And then we could take log population out of the typical linear model, and we could insert it in here. Uh, and then it's saying that populations with uh, islands with similar populations are expected to be similar. You'll get very similar predictions, but it'll use cooling. So this is the like continuous category equivalent of varying slopes uh, is the way to do it. So you get two relevance parameters. It estimates them se separately. Um, uh, you can these things can be quite complex. They can have periodic components. Uh, lots of fun stuff with that. Um, goes on. Stunned? Okay. <laughs> um, my goal here is just to expose you to this and give you an idea when you see it, what's going on. There's nothing mystical about Gaussian process regression, and I think it's going to become increasingly popular uh, now that it's very easy to do on desktops or help phones, for that matter. Um, so you're going to see it a lot more, and I want you to be able to ride that wave rather than be intimidated by it, uh, is the idea. Okay, any questions before I transition to the next part of this? All right. Uh, for the rest of today's lecture, I'd like to start um, the last major unit of the course, and we'll uh, we'll get through about half of this today, I think, and do the se uh, second half uh, on Thursday, um, and that'll leave us time to do debriefing right at the end and explain your final exam and stuff like that. Right. So uh, what we're going to transition to now is talking about uh, the last chapter, the last working chapter of the book, chapter fourteen, where we expand the horizon of uh, what we can do by reconsidering what measurements are and how we can get error in them into it and also deal with the fact that sometimes we don't have complete cases. We don't have the same amounts of data for all cases, uh, but we'd like to use all the data. And in traditional approaches, we don't have a way to do that. The nice thing about the Bayesian approach um, is that it gives you an easy way to do that. Uh, before I go on to flatter the Bayesian approach more, though, I should say the awful thing about the Bayesian approach is the computational load. So I was explaining to someone in my office hours recently that there's like this sweet spot in Bayesian inference where data sets are kind of just right. But like tiny data sets, it basically doesn't matter what you do because you can't learn anything anyway, right? So I don't care what model you use, <laughs> right? 
might as well just throw darts at paper and say you can glue something with tiny data sets, right? But uh, uh, it doesn't much matter. So you don't get the extra power. Um, uh, or another way you can say about it, with tiny data sets, the prior is what matters. And no statistical paradigm is free of that, even if they don't require you to define priors. Yeah, it's still lurking there, right? So um, in the intermediate uh, um, data set size, Bayesian inference really comes into, has huge advantages because computationally we can still do it. And you can get full Bayesian inference. You can get the posterior distributions. And it's easy to incorporate some of the more uncomfortable issues for classical statistics, like the ones we'll deal with today, like missing data and measurement error. Um, with really giant data sets, with millions of rows, uh, computationally, it's too expensive to do Bayesian inference. You'll be waiting. You, you have to finish your PhD. And you can't wait for it to finish sampling uh, all that data. And so you're going to have to use some approximation or some other technique. Uh, so I think, as I said in the book, I think because of that, um, approximations to or alternatives to Bayesian inference are always going to be necessary. Uh, always. Yeah. Can you use like a cluster computer or a supercomputer to run some of those? Ooh, maybe. The question was how you use a supercomputer or, or something to run these things. It's, it's hard to parallelize Markov chain computations. But that's a, I, I, I'm hesitate. I say right now it's hard. People are working really hard on that. Uh, so um, now that statisticians are done fighting over whether it's OK to be Bayesian, <laughs> which they spent like all last century doing, um, now they're knuckling down to work on a computation. And there's been a huge amount of advance since the 90s on how to sample from these uh, uh, inconvenient uh, likelihood functions that we need. So people are working hard on how to parallelize sampling from these distributions. So maybe in five years, the answer will be different. <coughs> right now, basically, Nah, I mean, so if it was a really, really super fast computer, you could run that one chain really fast, maybe that'd be okay. But usually what we get in cluster computing is just distributed processing. And you get almost, it's very hard to gain efficiency in this business from that, unfortunately, right now. So, no, I think still we're in that sweet spot area. But most of you, I've seen your data sets, and you're in the sweet spot. <laughs> right, so uh, it's, it's okay. But if you've got a 10 million row consumer database, I would say don't be Daisy. Uh, use something else, uh, boosted regression trees or something. Some, you need regularization, so that doesn't change. And machine learning, what I love about the, the culture of machine learning is it's really into, into regularization, and that's what I like about the Bayesian approach, too. Um, but anyway, it's the world according to me. All right, so let me introduce this topic with pancakes. These are pancakes. Uh, <laughs> they are. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> My spouse is like, those are not pancakes. <laughs> Let's call them pancakes, okay? <laughs> so it's the best I could do. Uh, so these are, these are three pancakes that I made, let's say. And when I started cooking them, the skillet was too hot. So my first pancake is burnt on both sides. That's what the line's on. Right? It's not my boot print. And uh, the second pancake is only burned on one side. Right? So it's good on the, on the downside. And the third pancake is edible. Right? It's just right. So there are these three pancakes. You come over to my house, say, I've made these three pancakes, and then I serve you one at random, because I'm an asshole. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but you, all you know is you've gotten one of these three pancakes, and uh, it's on your plate, and you can only see the top side, and the top side is burnt. And I want you, before you turn the pancake over, to tell me, on the basis of probability theory, this will be your final exam, uh, what's the probability the downside of this pancake is burnt? Shush. <laughs> so those of you who know the answer, shush. I want people to think about this for a second. This is a classic uh, probability paradox, like really classic, like back when French gamblers were figuring out probability theory classic. And um, Joseph Bertrand uh, is the guy who did it. But just think about it for a second, what you think the probability is. Um, nearly everyone, let's say 80% of uh, people who take probability theory courses get this wrong. It's a common uh, brain teaser that's given to people. Most people say one half. So if you were, if you were thinking one half, you're a normal human being. Uh, if you weren't thinking one half, you might still be wrong. Hang on. <laughs> I'll figure that out. But I said one half when I first saw this, so no, no shame. Uh, what I want to show you is what I've learned to do over the years with probability theory is never try to use my intuition. But my intuition is terrible, absolutely <laughs> terrible. Um, my brain was evolved to like hunt gazelle on a savanna or something, right? <laughs> it wasn't evolved to do probability theory. <laughs> and so, like most people, my intuition is bad. And the nice thing I think about the Bayesian approach to statistical inferences, since it's just applied probability theory, you take all uncertainty and define it as a distribution, you don't have to be clever. You just have to state the information you have and then let probability theory discover the implications. And I like that because I'm not clever. 
right? Uh, if you're infinitely clever, then you, you can do very well in some other paradigm. But if you're just like me, you don't feel particularly clever about these things, uh, the Bayesian approach has some real advantages. So let me walk you through real quick what I mean about not being clever in this case. I mean, it's just apply the axioms of probability. Don't even stop and like try to use your intuition. Just resist and just say, okay, what's the definition of conditional probability? Conditional probability is this thing that lets us take what we already know uh, and condition what we want to know upon it. That's what conditional probability means. And there are rules to do this, and they're easy. And when you run your Markov chain, that's what it's doing. It's conditioning the model on the data. The data is what you know. You like to know the parameters. Right? That's what posterior distribution gives you. This case, the pancake case, is a little bit similar. Let me run you through it real quick. Um, so what you here's the definition of conditional probability. In this case, we want to know whether the downside is burnt. We know the upside is burnt. Uh, by the definition of conditional probability, it is the joint probability that both sides are burnt. In other words, the probability that it's the uh, first pancake, right? That the first pancake is burnt on both sides. Um, divided by the probability of any side being dealt to me, any, any top side being burnt. Okay, so now we just have to figure out these components and we can plug them in. So this is what I mean by not being clever. You just remember this rule and then you brute force it. I call this being ruthless. And... So uh, the top part's easy enough. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, the bottom part is the only tricky part. You just remember this is an unconditional probability, so that means we average across all of the things that could be conditional upon. So there are three possible pancakes. Each one has its own unique probability of having the upside be burnt. If it's the first pancake, the burnt burnt pancake, that's what probability BB means, then it's guaranteed that the upside is burnt because either side. It can be dealt either side, right? And uh, so it's guaranteed to be burnt. If it's the burnt, unburnt pancake, the second pancake that I made, um, there's a half chance that the top side is burnt. There's a half chance that it wouldn't be. And then with the last pancake, if, if I dealt you that one, which obviously didn't happen, uh, there's no chance uh, that you would get a burnt side up. Make sense? So this is all we need to calculate the probability the burnt is up, and it is a half. Right? Why? Because probably each pancake's a third. With me? I know this is fun, right? Uh, <laughs> And then, um, also, the probability of getting the burnt, burnt pancake is a third. So the top, the numerator is a third, the uh, denominator is a half, and the answer is two-thirds. So if anybody got that, congratulations, you're awesome. And uh, uh, this is, there are a whole bunch of probability paradoxes like this, which are only seem paradoxical because we use our intuitions to solve them. And modeling is often like this, in the sense that the, the output of a model can seem paradoxical because it violates our intuition. But if you believe the information you put into the model, then the only thing wrong here is your intuition. Right? Now, sometimes your intuition is good, and you do have to check these things. So I'm not saying the model always wins. But what I value about the pure probability approach to statistical inference is that I don't have to be clever. None of us do. We just have to know the information and state it, uh, and then all the implications are discovered by the calculus of probability. Uh, it's the logic of science as to think about it. So I want to show you some examples of what I call getting ruthless uh, in this sense, where we discover counterintuitive implications of things we know about data uh, that we very hard to figure out unless you were infinitely clever. And there are infinitely clever statisticians out there that have found non-Bayesian solutions, which are basically the same as this. Uh, but they were really clever. The Bayesian approach is unglamorous in the sense that you just define the information, and then it's the model that's clever. Um, and so it's not nearly as glamorous, right? Um, but we're going to go with the not needing to be clever approach here. And I want to show you two really useful practical examples that all of us have all the time in our data sets, I think. Uh, these are measurement error and missing data. Uh, we like to incorporate uncertainty in measurements into our data. Usually we just ignore it, right? Yeah, that wasn't measured very precisely. I'm just going to take the mean. We all do this. I've done it. It's bad. <laughs> we should use all the information. And error is information. We just need to state it in the model, and we can use it. And the model figures out what it means. The second is missing data. We'd like to use all the data, but what most of us do is throw away any case that has even one missing value, because that's all classical methods can do. Uh, and that's data deletion, right? Complete case, uh, the complete case treatment. And that loses a lot of power in the average case under benign conditions where the missingness is random. You just lose power. It doesn't buy assessments, but you lose power. Uh, probably in more realistic cases, you would also bias as estimates because the missingness is not random. Um, so we'll look at both of these. Today, uh, we'll get started on measurement error, um, and uh, we'll do missing data first thing on Thursday. Um, well, we'll probably finish measurement error on Thursday and then, and then uh, do missing data. So 
First, measurement nearly always entails error. The error can be reduced to be quite small in nice benign cases, but often it can't be. Um, almost all regression models assume some kind of error process on the measurement. And so like in a classical linear regression, that sigma, the residual variance, it's neutral about where it comes from. It's not clear. Some part of it might be measurement error on the outcome or the predictors. Uh, uh, or it could be just stuff we've uh, left out of the model that's actually causing things. So remember, randomness in, uh, in this class is the property of information and not of the world, right? So it's not that the data is actually in error. It's there's stuff that's made it that it's a deterministic universe, I hope. And so uh, something has made it there, it's just we don't know the cause. And so we call that random in statistics. Uh, but it's the, what's random is the information, remember. So there is error, in a sense, accounted for in, in all statistical models, because none of them expect to exactly predict everything uh, ideally, right? This is not Newtonian mechanics, where you expect to be able to predict exactly where the cannonball lands. Uh, this is a different business. Um, but uh, uh, often we have cases where the error isn't constant across observations. Uh, uh, we're going to work with a case of that today. Um, and also a case of error on predictors, which we'll probably get to first thing on Thursday. Um, so let's start with the case of error on an outcome variable. We're going to return to the divorce data set uh, from way back in, boy, when was this? Chapter 5? Like forever ago, right? You guys were naive back then. <laughs> now you're Bayesian rock stars, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so remember the Waffle House, right? The divorce rates are correlated. Okay, so we're going to focus on the divorce and marriage rate problem. Um, a thing about the data that we ignored at the time is that divorce rate is measured with error. It's just a sample from each state. It's not the total population. Uh, and so there are col there's a column in that data set which is divorce standard error, uh, which is the, the expected standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the value that was given. Um, uh, and what's important is that the error is not constant across states because small states have less certain estimates. They have bigger standard errors. So there's less data from them. Uh, so tiny states like Wyoming uh, have big standard errors on their divorce estimates. Uh, big states like New York it's measured extremely precisely, right? And I think actually New York has, a, has an unreasonably low divorce rate uh, for some reason. For the longest time in New York, it was illegal to get a divorce in New York. I think this is why. They all went to Vegas to get divorced, uh, something like that. So, uh, but this is the big obstacle. So when you look at the plots on the right-hand side of this slide, um, median age at marriage uh, is shown in the top against divorce rate. Uh, for each state, the vertical lines are the standard errors of each measurement. You can see that there's a lot of heterogeneity in those errors. Uh, and uh, some of that heterogeneity is actually correlated with the divorce rate that's been estimated as well. And this is going to turn out to matter. Uh, because some of these points should have more weight in the regression than others because there's less certainty about the value. Um, and there are a bunch of ad hoc non bayesian procedures which just do that. They just construct weights based upon precision of the estimates. And those, those can work uh, unreasonably well, but you have to be clever in order to do the derivation. We're going to be unclever. We're just going to state the error, and we're going to let the model figure it out. Uh, and we'll get uh, a great, uh, we'll get, reveal some interesting implications. Um, and when I show you, the bottom one is just showing you that the uh, standard deviation is related to log population, right? It's the magnitude of the population that matters in each state. So big states, um, it's like California is all the way over there on the right, right? It's the biggest one. We have a pretty low divorce rate. Okay, so because the age of marriage is high, basically. Um, approach, we're going to treat the true divorce rate as unknown, which means it's a parameter. Everything you don't know in a Bayesian model is a parameter. And uh, so we're going to have 50 parameters, uh, one for each outcome that we'd like to know. We're going to estimate a posterior distribution for it, and we're going to predict uh, that posterior distribution with a, with a Gaussian likelihood, the model just like before. So here's the assumption, the way we get the um, measurement error information into the model. Uh, the observed rate is understood to be sampled from a Gaussian distribution for which we do not know the mean. And the mean is the true value. So what we've observed is a sample from some Gaussian sampling process with error. That's what if the error is reported as a standard error, that means it's a standard deviation of a sampling process that is, well, all we know about is it's, we don't know it's Gaussian, but we've only got two moments, and so the maximum entropy thing to do is call it Gaussian. You have no other information, so any other, assuming any other distribution is illogical here, right? It implies you know other information, and we don't. So it implies there's a sampling process which has produced this observation. It has some unknown mean, which is the true value, and then there's some standard error, which we do know. 
So in this, there's data on the left, there's a parameter in the middle, and then there's data in the standard error. And this states the information we have to estimate this thing that we don't know uh, in the model. And in the context of the full model, it looks like two regressions uh, in the same model estimated simultaneously. At the top now, the estimates, the true divorce rates in each state, uh, are modeled with a mean mu sub i for each state i, and that's the same regression we had before. There's an impact of agent marriage and an impact of the marriage rate. So we're interested in, in uh, uh, how each of those contributes partially to predicting divorce rate in a state. You remember that story from back in chapter five? Um, then there's this second thing, which looks also looks like a likelihood, where the observed value is predicted by a unique mean for each one that we don't know, but a known standard error. And so we get a posterior distribution for the estimates, and then those are the things that are being predicted by the regression at the top. <coughs> yeah, it's a little bit meta, I know. Uh, but this is exactly like everything you've done before. It's just now you have to appreciate that data in the Bayesian paradigm is a special case of a probability distribution where all the mass is piled on a single value. You're sure that that a random variable has a unique value. It's been determined. Then that's a that's a delta function. You get this spike of probability mass at a unique value, and that's all the things we called data before in this course are like that. Measurement error is spreading the uncertainty out over multiple values. Right? You're not sure exactly where it is, but you know it's in a range of plausibilities, um, and that's what the standard errors let us define. Uh, then you don't we, uh, looking at this. I don't know about you, but I don't know what the implications are. Uh, but logic will figure it out, right? Just let your computer figure it out. Um, no need to be clever. Uh, and, uh, oh, this is the stuff. I had some animation. This is stuff to explain to you. Yeah, divorce rate estimate appears twice in the model. That's okay. Uh, doesn't, doesn't break anything. It has implications in both cases. And because of that, information is going to flow between both of those models uh, that are in there, both of those Gaussian distributions. Um, and you can think about uh, these are two different likelihood functions. There's a likelihood for each estimate. There's a likelihood for each observation. Um, and uh, the rest is just logic, as they say. All this does is state what we know, right, and what we want to know about it. You with me? And fitting this in map to stand is just a matter of typing it. Uh, it looks exactly the same. Uh, and uh, this gets passed off to stand exactly as it looks. Um, and this fits fine. Uh, the only thing to notice is I turned off WAIC calculations because my WAIC function is not set up to recognize that the outcome is a distribution, so it won't properly integrate over it. Um, you can compute WAIC in this case, but you're going to have to do it on your own. By there's no loop involved to integrate over the posterior uncertainty in the thing you're predicting, right? Uh, so if that didn't make sense, don't worry about it. <laughs> that like wide-eyed, like oh my god, or is this is this on the test? No, <laughs> uh, but that's why I've turned off WAIC just so. It doesn't throw an error and, and uh, uh, compel you to tears or something. So, um, was that a hand? So, yeah. So, like, which part mean makes you have to turn off the WASC? Uh, the div est being okay. uh, it has a likelihood, right? So, WAIC is is done over predictions. It's on the prediction scale. Here, the thing you're trying to predict is your estimate, oh, okay. and that's uncertain. So, you you have to integrate over the uncertainty in the data. How does it? Know what you're trying to predict, like when you do. Um, I'll answer that question after class, <laughs> just because I'm sorry. It's a great question. It's but just, I mean, like if you do like sim or link, like it, it guesses what you're trying to predict. Well, it knows it's the, the model. First thing you put. It knows the model. Okay. Yeah, it knows the it knows the model. So yeah, it gets the likelihood. Well, it's not the first thing you put. It's it's the thing that looks like a likelihood uh, is what it pulls out. Um, is what it does, yeah. It's using a very uh, error-prone artificial intelligence to figure it out. But it knows the model because you typed it once. That's all it is. Uh, but it won't work for all model types. So this is a case where it won't. Um, I suppose if I, if I toiled long enough, I could make it work. But uh, I have other things to do, I suppose. So um, all right, let me show you the consequence of this. And uh, so on the left, what I'm showing you is um, uh, the relationship between median age of marriage and divorce rate in the raw data. Uh, so the open circles in the left-hand plot are the observed estimates, what we called divorce rate before, and then the bars are their error bars against median age of marriage. That's what we ran a regression line through before. You can see there's a strong relationship. Um, on the right, uh, the points now are the posterior distributions of divorce rate. Uh, and I think these are standard deviations of the posterior distribution. Uh, as well, uh, so that they're on the same scale. And uh, what I want you to see is they've all shrunk 
Um, and one of the reasons is because you've got states like this one in the lower right of the left-hand plot, which are extreme values. They have pretty extreme divorce rates, but they're highly uncertain, right? Uh, and that's true in many cases. Uh, you get these ex uh, a number of the points that are farthest out are the ones with the most uncertain estimates. And so pooling, yes, our friend pooling, uh, pulls them towards the regression line as a consequence of the fact that they have less weight. So information flows out of uh, the estimates that we have into the regression model, but also out of the coefficients. The line induces gravity and shrinkage on the estimates of divorce rate and shrinks them towards the regression line. It's the same shrinkage phenomenon in general that we observed with varying intercepts, uh, but now in a context, another context. And again, you don't have to plan for shrinkage. You just get it for free as an implication of the logic of the model. Uh, so what happens in this case, because of where the errors are, where the biggest errors are located, is that the blue uh, regression trend here, uh, the one that has a less steep slope, is the one that we get uh, from the regressing on the posterior divorce rates. So it has moderated uh, uh, the posterior estimate of the association between uh, median age of marriage and divorce rate. You can think that the naive estimate that didn't account for measurement error got too excited by the fact that there's these outlying states. Uh, but they had highly uncertain estimates, and we ignored that. We got misled. We were overconfident about what had happened. But I should say, measurement error won't always result in a moderation of the effect. It depends upon where the asymmetries and errors are. Right? All depends. And in this case, it results in a moderation of the association, but that won't always be true. It depends upon the exact data and what's going on. Does this make some sense? Yeah. This is pretty deep, I know. Uh, there's all this error on outcome. Um, let me try to summarize this for you real quick. Uh, uh, so, yeah, this is what I just said. It could have increased. The association could have increased. It all depends upon where the small states are and what their median ages of marriage are. Uh, it just so happens that, well, I won't go into the details. I'm tempted to talk about Rhode Island for a second, but uh, uh, things like that, uh, Wyoming. Um, so, but divorce rate estimates do move from the observed values, and the reason is shrinkage uh, and pooling. So small states are highly uncertain rates. They have low influence on their regression. The large states transfer information to them. They inform them. How do they do that? Through the regression line. Because the regression line is what the model knows about the relationship between the predictor and the outcome. So it's trying to get a posterior distribution of the divorce rate in each state, which has been informed, improved, by what you've learned about the relationship between divorce rate and median age of marriage from all the states together. And again, you have to be infinitely clever to figure all this out right, on your own. In this case, you just define what you know about the error, and it figures it out purely logically. Um, uh, I value that hugely in this. Uh, so information also flows the other way, right? Uh, uh, the regression line is obviously informed by what we know about the states, and the states with uncertain posterior distributions, why posterior distributions inform it less. And all that happens simultaneously in the joint probability distribution that is the model. Um, OK, this seems like a good place to stop. Uh, questions? No? Having fun? This is like the bonus round for the course here because you're not going to be, you're not going to do a homework on this. Let me put this slide up just to say this is what we're going to pick up on Thursday. We're going to stick with this example and we're going to add measurement error on yet another variable in the data set. We'll have two variables of measurement error and we'll keep trying. All right. Thank you guys. So, what do you guys want to do?